welcome wow. to the new edition of the Interjections podcast. This uh, episode is uh, going to cover another hidden gem as we've been going through the undiscovered decade of the 1990s. Uh, that was my terrible Walken accent in honor of Christopher Walken, as you saw in Corey's shirt. I uh, was in King of New York in September 1990. So that's what we're going to be covering today. You just reemerged as if you were coming from Rikers Island in jail for 12 years. Actually, I don't know how long he was in there. Is that Rikers or Sing Sing? It's supposed to be Rikers, apparently. They call no. it Sing Sing. Or no, Sing Sing's up <clears throat> the river, like closer to Albany. Well, he does <laughs> say that he's been there half his life, so. Yeah. Half his life, okay. Okay, so it was at least 12 years. <laughs> Yeah, I was thinking like 20, so I'm like, no. Yeah, I don't think they actually say a number, but well, they don't need to. He's in for a while. It's got to be short enough that all of his his uh, crime family remembers him. You know? Yeah. So pretty much this is a uh, mafia movie, right? It's uh, rival gangs throughout Manhattan. Uh, maybe not like Italian mafia as we know it as another popular film that came out this month uh represented but it's it's a gang movie crime cops and crime drama yeah so christopher walken is the head of his own outfit uh they actually do a little switcheroo when you start when he gets back from rikers uh you're you're thinking that there's a rival gang taking out other leaders because Lawrence fishburne and his men take out one of their rivals and then show up at Walken's hotel room as he arrives. And then it turns out they're buddy, buddy. And it's actually that Lawrence Fishburne is his number two. So okay. I thought that was a neat little thing. So Lawrence Fishburne is amazing in this film, I think. He's oh, yeah, he's part. great. Yeah. You mean uh, Larry Fishburne? He, uh, yeah. This Larry, is when yeah. to Lawrence from Larry. Yeah. He, 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 <laughs> he, pl- he plays... He plays- he plays psychotic pretty well. Yeah. Which is surprising considering like most people's like conception of uh, Lawrence Fishburne is a uh, Morpheus from the Matrix. Yeah, that's his like, big thing. A now. wise dude, but yeah. Like, it's funny because you like, and I were talking about the many shades of Giancarlo Esposito because of the Mandalorian, and we get to see another side of him in this movie. Yeah, he's another one of Walken's men. Uh, and it's, it's they're both so young in this. It's just so weird because they become like wise. Or, or alternate identities now that we know them as. Because this has an incredible supporting cast. Yeah, yeah. you got Steve Buscemi, another one of Walken's men. Yeah, um, Paul Calderon, who's popped up in a bunch of things. Harold Perrineau shows up as a subway mugger at one point. It's his first significant role in anything, so that was cool. And I actually picked him out. Mm. So yeah, um, David Caruso, that Miami. David Caruso is yeah. one of the cops. I didn't recognize him till like way later in the movie because like the way he, like he's so young and uh, skinny that like uh, it wasn't until like later when he was at like at a certain angle just like looking down and like serious. I'm like, I know that look. You don't recognize him. Sunglasses, sunglasses come glasses. off or on. But yeah. yeah. David Caruso has made, just made a career out of being an asshole cop. Yeah, yeah. he really has. Because <laughs> then he does NYPD Blue right after this. Yeah, uh, Wesley Snipes is in the movie. Who also had his own hit thing, New Jack City, right after this. Right. I knew him from CSI Miami. Wesley Snipes? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, they actually both weren't that big yet. I didn't realize. I thought Wesley Snipes was bigger in the 80s. But this is when he kind of takes right. off. So I didn't realize until I was looking up the trivia for this. He actually was brought on because David Caruso suggested him because they were buddies. Hmm. And so they're, that's why their camaraderie is pretty palpable, right? <laughs> so, um, yeah, right before this, he had done Mo Better Blues, which wasn't huge, but you know, it was like he's getting famous in 1990, right? It's one of those things where he pops up in two movies back to back, you know? Yeah, so, um, who else was there? The women weren't big, but there was uh, Teresa Randall. Yeah, Teresa Randall, who I haven't seen the Bad Boys movies, but I've seen Space Jam, so at least I've seen her in something else. All right. No, she's her not the part favorite. of that. That's, that's yeah. not why I watched Space Jam. But uh, she was good in this. She doesn't really say much, but she has some interesting facial expressions, so I kind of want to see her have a bigger role. So I got I to gotta check out the Bad Boys movies. I'm pretty sure one of the guys um, <laughs> that was in... 
uh, Fishburne's first scene with the uh, with with Steve Buscemi and all that. I'm pretty just like some guy standing against the wall with a beard was like the um, the guy from Airplane. I swear, was the the guy from Airplane? Robert Hayes. Pilot, yeah. I swear. I, I, I know who you're talking about. That was not Robert Hayes, but he kind of looks like him. You know what? I'm saying with Robert Hayes. I've decided it's there. That's what he did right before Homeward Bound, The Incredible Journey. Yeah, and one of Frank's prostitutes was Julie Haggerty. <laughs> yeah, right. That'd be weird. Yeah. Um, you know, it's funny. This movie is like pretty renowned for a lot of memes. Like you, you see this movie pop up in a lot of memes. Is it really? Uh, yeah, and you can see there's a couple moments in the movie that you know there's some walkinisms that are pretty popular. Like him doing the swing dance when Lawrence Fishburne comes out. Yeah. And uh, him trying on the glove. Oh, yeah. That that one I did know. Isn't that how but, he got the Fat Boy Slim video? Yeah. They kind of yeah, got so much. Yeah, I bet. But uh, I felt like he, he wasn't just uh, kind of traipsing on his iconic status. I felt like he brought like kind of a, an enigma and a a melancholy to the character especially in the first scene when he's coming out of jail and she's like do you want to stop and he's like no he's looking around his old neighborhood just yeah. kind of uh, like navel gazing it was kind of a cool entrance because he you were saying he doesn't talk for like 15 minutes i think yeah his movie. first major line is 15 minutes in okay. yeah so he's like, no. it, it, it gives it this unsettling quality that you know he's king of New York because that's the title. So if you don't know anything about this and you see him get out of jail, it's like, what is he really? Is he a former king? Is he going to make it like start from the bottom now and rise back up? Yeah. But he kind of was anyway. So he's reclaiming his throne. Oh, it's kind of a postmodern Robin Hood. That's before him. Yeah. Just a random nerd thought. Like since he's king of New York, you know, that means he's an integral character in the... Uh, Popular anime known as Bleach. Is that Kong? Oh, King yeah. of New York. Oh yeah, ah, I never ah, thought of that. If anybody, yeah, we watched Bleach a little bit. I don't think it was cool well, back in the day. Yeah, I've been watching a while. But uh, I think this movie is Abel Ferrara's take on Robin Hood. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I can a, see that. A, a gangster Robin. Yeah, because then yeah, the Warren Fishburne is definitely like. Um, What's his name? Baloo in the animated one. Oh, Little John. Yeah, Little John. Thank you. Sad that that's what I went to. Um, but you got all the other guys. You got the uh, Robin O. I don't remember the characters in Robin Hood right now. I'm blanking. It's fine. Um, but the Plaza <laughs> Hotel is like his Sherwood Forest. Right. When he meets those guys in the subway when he's having sex on the subway for some reason. Right. Um, sure. He offers them jobs like he's trying to get them to be part of his merry band of thieves. Mm-hmm. You got your Sheriff of Nottingham, who uh, we just saw in Quick Change as the uh, mafioso that uh, Bill Murray tells off, which I didn't realize. We spent the whole movie like, why have we seen him? Yeah, he was like, (laughs) he's familiar. We'll figure it out later. Maybe he was in another gangster film we saw. Yeah, so that's Victor Argo. Yeah. Um, But he has his own men. I don't remember Sheriff of Nottingham having henchmen, but I mean, it is more David Caruso and Wesley Snipes at first trying to take him down. Because they have this idealistic vengeance that uh, they think cops... There's that speech that Caruso gives where he's like, we're supposed to be the good guys, and, and it's like the scumbags that run the system. So how are we ever going to be called good people? Which is right. kind of a point at this year. Uh, so. But they keep it deliberately ambiguous as to what his agenda is until like the final act. Walking, yeah. 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 And I like that a lot. I still don't know exactly what he wants just to be king. I think I think what it is is like uh, they they kind of hint at it and then he like kind of just comes out about it to the uh, older uh, detective oh, or cop. Okay. Like he, he just, like he, we, we know he's a bad guy because he's doing gangster <laughs> shit. He's killed a lot of people. He's pushing drugs. But like uh, he establishes uh, later on uh, to the detective when they have a face to face. He's like, hey, look. Uh, all, all this stuff that I'm pushing, like the drugs and whatnot, like that's been around since forever. I'm just a business guy, like trying to make a buck. 
But you know what I'm not doing? I'm not doing what all the other gangsters that I took out and have replaced. I'm not like prostituting children. Uh, I'm not- um, Human trafficking. Human trafficking. I'm not human trafficking. Uh, Like a crap ton of the money that I'm making, I'm trying to save the hospital. So like, yeah, sure. I'm a a bad guy, but like, I'm not a bad guy. I'm a good guy. He's yeah, sort of good guy in a bad situation. <laughs> yeah. Yes, comes back around. So, like, I think his motives are like <clears throat> he's like your, your your typical like street kid that grew up, found power, and wants to give back to the community in a weird way. That he that makes sense to him because he probably grew up this way. This is all yeah. he knows. That's so, a like, good point. Yeah. So he's like a Nucky Thompson. Yeah, it's uh, you only have a short amount of time in life. So if you're going to be filled into this situation, you might as well take advantage of it rather than bang your head against the wall like Caruso. Yeah. You know, kind of, you know, the way that that Corey described it as the, you know, gangster Robin Hood. Yeah. You know, a a good way of of looking at it, because I do like the premise and you know he's just he's already this notorious kingpin he's already been in jail he can't change that legacy so now he's just going to use it to bring the the less fortunate back up to a decent level you know that's why when he's getting mugged on the subway he just throws the money and says just come work for me yeah, I even took that moment as like he doesn't fear death because if this is it, this is as far as I got. You know. Yeah, and another and another uh, like moment where that like that mentality is like solidified is uh with this uh like secondhand man uh Fishburn, um, yeah. Fishburn when he's um <laughs> at some point in the movie he gets arrested, but before he gets arrested, he goes into a uh, uh, chicken place. Yeah, fried chicken, that was a good scene. yeah fried chicken joint. And like, um, as he walks in, the uh, person behind the register is giving a hard time to the kids that are just goofing around the uh, um, arcade games, but they don't, he knows they don't have money. So he's like, get away from those. You're not, you're not going to play with them. Why are you in front of them? Somebody with money might want to play with them. Go away. Shoo. And like Fishburne's character sees that and like, he starts giving, he starts giving the guy behind the uh, register just a hard time the whole time he's there like giving him an attitude uh smart mouthing him just like you know just uh trying to raz the guy and then like after he makes his order he walks over to the uh table that the kids are at sees the uh the grandmother of them and she looks tired she's beat and like uh probably broke because just kids money can't play video games a chicken wing um, or something so he walks over and just like hands him a handful of quarters. Like, guys, just go, go play video games, be young, have fun. And then you're like, oh wow, like he's I, being a, he, he was being he was being a prick to this guy behind the register for a reason. Yeah, he's not a bad guy. He's do, he's like doing the whole like give back to the community, look out for the little guy type deal. Yeah, it's a little uh, John move. Like, uh, fuck the guy that's working for the establishment i.e. the guy behind the register yeah that is that is a good point i really never thought of the robin hood thing but that's a really good angle yeah that's cool yeah um i liked every lawrence fishburne scene i think he's my favorite easily um he definitely steals the movie out from under christopher walken he's also yeah. the only one who actually shows any pain when he's being shot to death yeah, this is cool. like collapses in typical movie fashion. Lawrence Fishburne screams for five minutes. Yeah, yeah, He's which is pretty out. accurate. And, and he and he he does, he does like he does the uh, uh the pre death twitch pretty good. Yeah. yeah, you don't see that in most movies when He's, like somebody's dying. They're just like this is kind of like. Uh, <laughs> he's like no he's doing he's doing, like he's doing the body like the body's convulsing yeah he like, wants it, to be like, put out of his misery yeah because like the, that's what muscles do when you're dying like they start shaking uncontrollably yeah. because like just like the so. truly when larry became lawrence yeah one of the greatest actors of his day yeah i i want to see more of his early stuff i never saw boys in the hood so Oh, he's great, man. I check that. Uh, have you seen uh, Apocalypse Now? Oh yeah. Oh okay. yeah. Apocalypse like, Now is he, probably my favorite he, war he was film. Like so. a scrawny kid in that. Like yeah. when yeah. I saw that, I didn't recognize him. Yeah. Like I mean, 
Yeah, everyone's now he's a fat old man. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny. In terms of uh, Frank White's moral compass, you would think more gangster rappers would try to idolize him over Scarface because, like uh, Jimmy was saying, he has more of a magnanimous agenda, more so than Scarface did. Yeah. Just strange that he influenced a whole generation of gangster rappers and Frank White didn't. Although it is strange to think that it's Actually, a white man in charge of all black gang members. Did you also why the why the Italian guys? Well, so like why the Jason? Did you did you read the trivia on IMDb? I didn't know this. Apparently, uh, Notorious B.I.G. took Frank White as a pseudonym in a couple of his songs. Oh. I never noticed that, but obviously, I hadn't seen his movie yet. So I'll, was I'm that, to go back and listen to some songs. Was that following this movie, or did this movie take it from? Biggie. Uh, well, this is 90, so I think his albums are like 91. I don't know the exact years because I didn't really uh, listen to any Biggie until college. So, yeah. Because I did, just didn't listen to rap when I was right. a kid. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, um, the other thing, like at the beginning, I thought that he was supposed to be like a whitey bulger type. Right. Um, that was kind of because he did, he looked like whitey bulger too. So I'm like, is this supposed to be that but then i realized he's in new york and bulger was in boston yeah not boston I'm like maybe not yeah, his big stuff was after 91 so big but yeah i i agree with that take on bulger and everything oh yeah um, this is a pretty crazy movie also yeah. apparently it was financed by the richest man in italy who became one of the most corrupt men in Italy, Silvio Berlusconi. Which makes perfect sense for some reason. Are you trying to say that Abel Ferrara is corrupt? No. Well, no. Or he's crazy. Entirely. It in... could be both. Yeah. Well, he wasn't financing it. He just, you know, he got the money. He didn't make the money. Yeah. Well, this is. You know what I mean? This movie preceded his. Uh, his magnum opus, which is Bad Lieutenant. Yeah, these two movies are probably his peak, right? I would think so. Yeah. I didn't know this was sort of a trilogy of films. Obviously, Bad Lieutenant isn't part of it, but uh, there's the two other films, The uh, the Funeral and... Walkins in that. Yeah, and The Addiction, which is that vampire movie he does with Walken. Lily Taylor's in it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's kind of like a little f- trilogy with that. Um, Paul Calderon, who was the uh, the one that kind of rats the mags up the the location to the cops where Walken's men are gonna be. Uh he helped write Bad Lieutenant with him, I didn't realize. Oh, okay. Uh, and he's I love Bad Lieutenant. He has like a whole cabal of actors that that work with him in his films, Ferrara. Um, yeah, now uh Willem Dafoe works with him quite a bit. Yeah, hmm. that four 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 movie he did a couple of years ago, and Siberia that just came out. Oh, he did Siberia. Not the uh, Keanu Reeves movie. No, the, no, I know which one you're talking. Yeah, about. different one. Yeah, both but, are not well known. No. <laughs> but yeah, uh, Tony was uh, financing a bunch of movies around this time, so I think he helped get at least this. Did he? Did he finance Bad Lieutenant as well? Do you know? I know did sure. around the early 90s. Uh, I know Edward Pressman did Bad Lieutenant because then obviously he had the rights to do the remake gotcha. with uh, Nicolas Cage. Yeah. You like both though, right? Yeah, I love both of them. Yeah. I gotta see both this. distinctly different though. Yeah. Well, Ferrara's not afraid to get some uh strange sexual moments in there like the one on the uh, subway yeah like, yeah this like groping and like awkward heavy <laughs> making out this movie yeah. was quite like, gratuitous yeah you'd never see that from walking yeah before yeah well that's what bad lieutenant it's, has it's Her just him. frontal yeah it's walking. yeah that's it's right like openly like tongue out making out with people or 
like a third of the movie. I'm like, yeah, there's a hard cut to his tongue waggling in the yeah. subway. <laughs> it's just it's, disturbing. Well, apparently this movie has is that, is that like a signature thing of his? Like, you know how directors have signature shots that they do? How he kisses. Well, you know her. what? Um, that, that's his money shot. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say, throughout this movie and throughout uh, Bad Lieutenant, there's a lot of Catholic uh, iconography in the background. So they cut to the Virgin Mary statue a couple of times in this. And at one, and the whole plot in uh, Bad Lieutenant's revolving around the rape of a nun. So there's a couple of times where he goes into a church. Um, so I think that's like a running theme throughout of all Abel Ferrara's movies. Like an expiation of past sins too, which is what I guess Frank White's trying to do. Mm -hmm. That rape is actually why his longtime writer didn't help him with uh, Bad Lieutenant White Calderon came in, because Nicholas St. John wrote pretty much every film he's done in his first half of his career, except for Bad Lieutenant, which is his biggest. I was going to say the other really well-known Abel Ferrara movie that is kind of similar is uh, Miss 45. Right. And at one point she's uh, she goes to a costume party dressed as a nun. Yeah. But apparently Nicholas St. John has heavy Catholic leanings, so he didn't want to be a part of what happens in Bad Lieutenant. Oh. Uh, really. So fair. if you look at Miss 45, he's fine with that. He helped her. Right. So, and he writes this stuff. So. Yeah. Um, yeah, that, that woman that he is grouping in the subway, uh, this is probably her biggest thing. She shows up in a, another film of Ferrara's, but doesn't really do much else. She's, it's Janet Julian, who really never goes on to do anything else. She she left in 95 because she had some kids, left Hollywood, because she had uh, uh, some kids and then went to take care of them, became a teacher. Mm -hmm. So to any of her former students, if they want to check this out, the same. It might not be her. That might be a body double when they cut to it's the true. breast. True. That was, that was weird. Yeah. I mean, well, the, apparently this movie also had to be cut down significantly to avoid an X rating. Because it doesn't seem that violent. So is there an extended well, no, version I mean, with, all the, there with all the nudity, with all the with all the nudity, the 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 fucks and the you know the blatant drug use and licking cocaine off each other's bodies. I'm like, this is yeah, clearly true. like <laughs> almost yeah, an definitely X. Are. Well, it's certainly an Abel Ferrara movie. <laughs> yeah. yeah. A gratuitous everything. Right. If we can't come Let's up take... with any decent dialogue, we'll just shoot everybody. And... Yeah. Yeah, I take it Jeff's not a fan of this movie. I yeah. am not. I mean, I'm I, I I like the concept, I like the premise as far as like, you know, this this underworld Robin Hood, but it's just it's almost a parody of itself with all this just like it's constant machine guns, constant motherfuckers, constant like just throwing cocaine in each other's faces. I'm like it it feels like all of the bad crime movies that all of my classmates made in, in college. Yeah, but this time like, they this, like this was all their inspiration for that. And I'm like, it had a really good story that I feel like could have been a lot more emotionally impactful if they didn't just like blow everybody away when they couldn't think of something to say. I think that was his point. <laughs> I think that's <clears throat> what he wanted. Right. So. But I'm like, it, it but I feel like if there was that kind of message, it was lost because it was just gratuitous nonsense. I don't know. I get that. Did you watch this with Jen? I did, but her her commentary did not really change what my opinion was already. No, I'm sure. I. <laughs> Just think, watching this with significant others, they might not love this as much. This is oh, she was reading a book while it was happening. <laughs> not to label it or anything, but it's kind of a guy movie because it's gratuitous sex and violence and drugs and everything. It's not like women yeah. are more sensitive, but I know that at least my girlfriend would probably not like this. So. Yeah, no, she was reading a book while it was happening. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. 
but that's why I'm like, then it got me thinking about like all of the movies that came out that were like this. I'm like, this was a thing. And I am so glad I was not of age to see this onslaught of just like shitty gang movies. Yeah. Well, after this, you get stuff like Pulp Fiction and True Romance, which refined the genre into something that all the film bros that come up at our age wanted to replicate. Right. So right. everyone cites that, but it was already happening four years earlier. Right. Right. It's like it's like walking says. <laughs> you know, it was this was already happening before I came along. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 So it kind of came full circle. But I, don't yeah, know. I wonder if Ferrara pushed the envelope just because he could or because I don't know what because he was, he was financed by the richest, most corrupt man in Italy. Yeah. He could do whatever he wanted. He was yeah. a made man almost. Absolute power corrupts. Yeah. So obviously, I, I like the movie a lot. I don't know how you guys feel, Tristan and uh, Jimmy. Oh, I, I, I liked it. It was a uh, very. Um... Yeah, very, 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 very. Um, like I said, I probably wouldn't show this. He's so me. descriptive, Jimmy. This is gross. Right. yeah. No, no, I'm a I'm an artisan when it comes to describing uh, films. He's gonna ramble now. Yeah, I uh, I <laughs> the tiny suspenders. But it's 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 a bit much with all that gratuitous violence. I think. I think I liked it because I got to see uh, youthful performances from people like David Caruso, Lawrence Fishburne. Um, I love Christopher Walken. And having heard that this was one of his better movies, I was excited to see a role that I had put off for a while. So I think it was more that I was excited to see the actors yeah. do something different. Right. Lawrence Fishburne has never done something like this since because he became Morpheus in 99 and just hasn't stopped. That's sure. just, That became kind of a... Uh, peg that he got stuck on um but oh and wesley snipes I, I i said to you earlier this year Corey, that i wanted to see more wesley snipes because i just kind of have missed his filmography yeah so i think i liked it because i was excited to see all these actors right. and jeff is right it's a little a little bit much so i don't know that i'd watch this again i, mean, I liked it as i was watching it the, the, the little bit muchness of it you know kind of like it kind of goes with the fact that it is we we are entering the 90s sure so like that's like is is that is, <laughs> is that gratuitous like action that you'd expect from like 80s films and then like it's like okay we're setting the tone that we're gonna have for 90s action films yeah, there is this subtle transition that happens at every decade like what the feel is going to be for the next 10 years and the 90s wasn't sure what they wanted to be yet that's going to come up more and more in the next two years yeah because 10 right. Decades tend to overlap in theme and, and societal genre and everything, like how the hippies lasted not just in the 60s or the war feeling lasted through the 50s a little more, that sort of thing. So the over violent nature of action movies, I think, spills in for another few years. Right. And I actually thought this when uh, my, my Hera Piranu uh, pops up on that subway. Yeah. Uh, you see stuff like the Warriors and you see graffiti laden subway cars. Uh, you get a sense of what it was like to go into New York City in the 70s and then probably the 80s um, that it was dangerous. You shouldn't go into the city because it hadn't been cleaned up yet. Like right. uh, David yeah. Dinkins and later sort of Rudy Giuliani sort of clean up the city um around this time and so it's already empty and you know that like the woman that walk in holds hostage right at the end she she doesn't really freak out she's just like this makes sense i was gonna be held at gunpoint at some point this is commonplace in new york and so it's like on the verge of being cleaned up but everyone's so tired still yeah. and you kind of see that with like the cabbie that gets out of the, the car right at the end walkins dying and uh Everyone's just like, okay, the cops are swarming us. This makes sense. We're in Times Square, but who cares? Yeah. Right. <laughs> you can also this daily, happens once a week. It's a daily event. Yeah. 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 You can also so, tell that it was 
you know, I mean, it, it had to have been shot in like 89 or something. Uh, right. <laughs> but you could also tell because there was, in one shot, he walks past the, the sign for me and my girl on Broadway, which closed on New Year's Eve, 1989. Interesting. Oh, we got a piece of trivia. Uh, of when you when when you notice that sort of stuff. Good job, Jeff. Yeah. <laughs> hey, I'm like, I don't know. Um, That's cool. So yes. you know, they probably shot it somewhere between '86 and '89, and then probably '89 came out in '90. So I think everything we watched so far was shot in '89 because it tends to be that you edit it in the right, early. Yeah, yeah. So the next few okay. films we cover probably were early 90, just based on gestation of filmmaking, you know? Yeah, but there's also some movies that like you shoot them and then they're in development hell for three years before they even get out, so. Like loose cannons. Right. Right. Yeah. I don't think this was in development hell. <clears throat> I think this was just 89, but. I don't know. Just a fun little thing. <clears throat> um, so yeah. Also, I like the, the Nosferatu angle too because i had that in there and i'm like oh it's it's just you know drawing the parallel between christopher walken's character and christopher walken himself maybe and nosferatu well that's like max shrek in batman returns right uh, that's who nosferatu is mm -hmm. right well we'll be talking about that in a couple of years i hope so <laughs> so you want to tell us about some of the other movies actually there's yeah the nope. big one that I, I hinted at at the beginning. Do we want to do the the, the rating? Sure. No. Um, I what would give it a B plus. Oh right, yeah, rating. <laughs> Solid A. Yeah, I give it an A minus. C. See, I thought it was gonna be lower because he was so down on it. Well, no, dude, like I said, I like the concept or the premise, but I just. A little too over the top for me. So we essentially just gave it a B plus average. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. Perfect mind was the average. It's fine. Skewing that curve. <laughs> um, 